Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. Broadcasting Live presents Two Guys and a Bible with Don Preston and William Bell. Join us each week at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central as we bring you exciting, sound, challenging, and comforting messages regarding the end times. Thank you for tuning in today. Don Preston is the founder of Preterist Research Institute, or PRI. Don is a prolific author, having written and published 19 books, a host of audio and DVD studies, and is a debater and defender of the full preterist view. His websites are BibleProphecy.com, Eschatology.org, and DonKPreston.com. William Bell is the founder of AllThingsFulfilled.com Ministries and has a website bearing the same name, and has authored three books, audios and DVDs. He has published hundreds of articles and recordings. And now, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Two Guys in a Bible broadcast with Don Preston and William Bell. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Two Guys in the Bible right here on Fulfilled Radio, a voice you can trust. I am William Bell, and with me is Dr. Don Preston. And we're excited about the opportunity to study with you again, have a conversation with you about the things that pertain to the end time and other very important matters uh, found in the scriptures. And sometimes we just, you know, have a conversation and talk about what the latest issues are uh, going on uh, as we study uh, this subject and even share with you about uh, other people and their journey and uh, what's going on with them. But we are very, very excited. Uh, We keep hearing that uh, more people are joining us, and uh, we notice that, um, you know, the fact that we're getting opposition tells us that um, people are concerned that uh, it's growing too much, a little too much for them. And uh, and so they have to try to keep the heat turned up in that area as well. But we're here. Uh, it's a nice day. And um, I'm going to turn the mic over to Dr. Preston here. And let's hear what's happening out in Oklahoma. So, Don, yeah. tell us. Well, what's, what's the it, latest and the greats? Well, I tell you what. What you said there, I find amusing uh, and true. Uh, we continue to hear from lots and lots of people who are coming to understand covenant eschatology. They are thrilled about it. Uh, They are just, uh, as we have said before, they're falling in love with the Lord and with his word all over again. And what's so ironic about this, there's this website entitled Full Preterism, a thing of the past. And these guys are so naive, in addition to being arrogant, uh, eminently arrogant, uh, that they get on there, and just recently they said, preterism is dying, it's dead, blah, blah, blah. And yet, you know, William, I have reached on YouTube. In fact, I just noticed it a moment ago. I, I was checking some things on my YouTube channel. I have reached over 4,500 subscribers to my YouTube channel. That, I mean, to me, that's just absolutely remarkable. And I don't know how many subscribers you have on your channel, but about 3,500. We all right. Well, you see, here's the deal, folks. William and I have 4,500, 3,500 subscribers, and this this Facebook page claiming that uh, preterism is dead has a grand total of 130 members, and that includes uh, <laughs> that includes that us. Is, <laughs> that includes a bunch of preterists who get on there to defend the full preterist view. <laughs> so uh, when you start comparing uh, the number of subscribers that William and I have on our YouTube channel um, and the comments that we get, the positive feedback, uh, and, and the continual growth of our membership, and interest and what have you with this little Facebook page that that declares that preterism is dead and they've got 130 members, again, including a whole bunch of preterists. <laughs> I, just, uh, I just find that absolutely amazing and, and humorous that, that you have this group on there, and, of course, they, they consider themselves God's gift. Uh, to the world of theology, uh, when in reality they are 
uh, again, they're some of the most arrogant. In many instances, they are profane and vulgar. Uh, they, they, some of the members on that Facebook page have been caught in blatant, flat-out, purposeful lies when they've been exposed as liars. Uh, they have refused to acknowledge it. They refuse to repent and refuse to ask forgiveness. So anyway, uh, I, I just found all that situation to be, <laughs> to be incredibly ironic and incredibly humorous. Uh, it's just uh, just one of the ironies of the time that we're living in, William, and I find it humorous. Well, that's absolutely correct. And um, I, I suppose it's going to continue for a while, but, um, you know, at the same time, you know, the growth continues. And, you know, you just you mentioned just our YouTube channel that doesn't, you know, even cover our website and uh, the radio broadcast. And I, you know, I can see from, you know, stats from, you know, the radio broadcast that I do that, um, you know, many of those videos, you know, get up to a thousand views, not all of them, but, you know, several of them get over a thousand plus views and some that are up to 2000 views. So uh, people are interested, you know, not to say that all of the people who listen are preterists, but at the same time, I noticed that um, a lot of people come on um, on Sunday mornings. And, and by the way, while I'm talking about that, uh, we are possibly going to move to an earlier hour um, for Sunday morning. And uh, that would be great because then we can catch some of the drive time. Uh, people are usually in service a lot of times by nine that we come on at nine central. And so I've just gotten to go ahead or, or at least the approval for an, a spot that was vacated before me that, you know, the spot that was on before uh, I come on. Well, it's been vacated for a while. And so I've been asking for it. And I got word today from the program director that um, it's all mine. And um, so now we'll come on an hour early and uh, that'll give me, you know, an opportunity to, um, you know, get in some of these automobiles while people are driving, you know, to and forth and and um, at least um, hopefully provoke some interest from that perspective as well. But I think it'll be um, I think it'll be a good time. Well, I think that's absolutely great. And of course, uh, we both know that you've already been stirring up a lot of interest. Uh, and a lot of discussion with, with the time slot that you have. So uh, to be able to have an even better time slot just open, opens up more doors for, uh, for certain, and we're, we're thrilled at that, uh, at that opportunity. Uh, oh, a couple, of, uh, one, a couple of more items here before we get into our study this evening. You know, you mentioned the fact that uh, people coming out against us is proof that we are continuing to grow. The message is continuing to get out. Just today, I, pardon me, uh, I've had two different people send me links to YouTube videos in which ministers have come out uh, attacking the full preterist view. Now, the, these are evidently full-time ministers. I haven't had the opportunity uh, to watch both of the videos, but the people who sent them to me said, well, uh, you know, this this individual said they're really, a, but they just recently uh, produced this video against covenant eschatology, and they want me to uh, go on there and review it uh, and make some comments if possible, and I do intend to do that. But uh, that's just another example where people feel the reality uh, of the growth of covenant eschatology. And they know it's making inroads, and therefore they feel like they have to do something about it. They have to speak out. Well, that's okay. We've seen many, many times uh, in the past in which people spoke out against it and really sometimes very aggressively came out against us and set about trying to prove wrong the realization and the reality of fulfilled eschatology only to become preterists themselves. They discovered that the evidence is not there to refute covenant eschatology. And so they had become advocates. So, uh, you know, the more publicity we get, the more people will say, wow, I've got to check this out. Uh, is this really all that bad? Uh, how, how can it be as bad as the minister is talking about, etc.? And so uh, I think 
found it very encouraging that two more ministers had produced videos uh, to, in coming out against and speaking out against covenant eschatology. I can't wait to watch them. I can't wait to lead some remarks and comments. Who knows? It may lead to some good discussions uh, with both of those ministers to see if, uh, you know, see if something can become of that. So anyway, I just wanted to add that to the discussion uh, for everyone to be aware of some of the things that are going on. You know, folks, we're continuing to discuss the, the Messianic Temple. And two weeks ago, we got into Isaiah chapter 62. We covered some ground. I do want to rehearse that to bring that back to your memory because it's so wonderful. It's such rich, rich uh, information that we shared with you. Isaiah chapter 62 is about the remarriage of Israel. And that's where we, be, we, we began last week. Well, the remarriage of Israel has specifically to do with the divorce of Israel found in Hosea chapter 2. In Hosea chapter 2, the Lord accused Israel, the ten northern tribes specifically, of committing spiritual adultery. And as a result of that, Yahweh divorced the ten northern tribes. But he promised that the time was coming in which he would remarry them. Hosea chapter 2, 18 to 23. The Lord promised that the time was coming, and Hosea chapter 3 brings to mind that it would be in the last days. But in Hosea chapter 2, the Lord promised that he would make a new covenant with the ten northern tribes, which of course would include then the two, the two southern tribes when that time finally came. And he would betroth them to himself again in righteousness and betroth them to himself forever. But guess what? That's what Hosea predicted, and that's what Isaiah predicted. Isaiah 62 is one of those extremely rich passages that foretold the time in which the Lord would restore Israel. That would not be a nationalistic restoration. Uh, oh, I've just got to, <laughs> I, I've just got to take a, a brief moment of digression uh, back to Facebook. A, a Church of Christ minister on there named Kyle Mazingale posted this morning uh, about the Hebraic, uh, what he called the United Hebraic concept of physical res resurrection. That that testimony is there, it cannot be denied. And look, folks, make no mistake, the, uh, the Jewish testimony, the Jewish expectation of resurrection <clears throat> is not near as united as Mr. Mazingale wants, wants his audience to believe. But I posted back on there, and I haven't been able to get back on uh, later today. I've, I've been so busy. But I posted back on there that let's grant for a moment the Jewish expectation of a physical resurrection. They also anticipated, they longed for, their hope was of a physical restoration of nationalistic Israel. That expectation is almost unanimous in the sources. Uh, I have been reading uh, on and off, uh, you know, among the other seven or eight books I'm trying to, re uh, to read, uh, a handbook on the Jewish background of early Christianity. Uh, it's edited by Craig Evans, uh, a very noted world-class scholar, uh, and scholars such as uh, Stutz, uh, just think Stutz Bearcat, the, the old car. Uh, but the scholars in this pointing out, pointing out that virtually the unanimous belief and expectation and hope among the Pharisees, even the Sadducees, was of a nationalistic physical resurrection of the national polity of Israel. So I posed the challenge to Mr. Mazingato if he was going to be consistent with his view. O Covenant Israel expected a physical resurrection, therefore preterism is wrong because preterism rejects the idea of a physical bodily resurrection. However, national Israel expected a nationalistic, militaristic, so socio-economic, physical resurrection of the body politic of Old Co 
covenant Israel. Kyle Massingale rejects that as a biblical doctrine. Therefore, Mr. Massingale is wrong because he violates the hope of Israel. Oh, but wait. Got to throw this in. Can't forget, folks, that the coming of the kingdom is the time of the resurrection. If, therefore, Mr. Mazingale rejects the nationalistic restoration and resurrection of the old covenant nationalistic Israel, then since the kingdom and the resurrection are of the same nature, he must thereby, likewise, reject the concept of a physical bodily resurrection out of the dirt. I think that's kind of problematic for Mr. Mazingale. I can't wait to get back into the office in the morning and check Facebook to see what kind of a response Mr. Mazingale has offered. Now, if he follows suit, and if he follows his pattern, you know, for two weeks at least, William challenged him to explain some verses in Daniel chapter 12. Total silence. I challenged him for two weeks to answer some questions on Daniel 12 in addition to those posed by William Bell. Total silence. So I just suspect, William, I just suspect that Mr. Mazingale is going to be totally silent about the nature of Israel's kingdom hope. What do you think? I think you're absolutely correct. There's been a lot of silence going on. Uh, recently, <laughs> as a result, <laughs> as a result of questions and conversations that have been going on there, so yeah, I, I do believe that the silence will continue and um, just becomes all telling. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about going back and looking at all the areas where they were silent and putting together a little um, uh, little document on that and uh, just keep all those questions handy for the future. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I think that would be great. Share that with me when you do. <laughs> so, okay. I, I, I'm sorry. I apologize, folks. I just had to take that digression because it is such a stunning reality uh, of total inconsistency on the part of the enemies of coveted eschatology. Here they want to latch on to a concept of physical resurrection that they claim was Israel's hope. Well, in the first place, the Sadducees rejected that. But anyway, they want to latch on to that. But then they want to turn around and reject the what is without a doubt, seemingly so, at least according to this book that I've cited, and according to Emil Schurer in his life and times of Jesus the Messiah, uh, in the backgrounds uh, of the first century church and, and other works that we can cite, uh, all of these works are agreed that the expectation of the first century Jews was of a nationalistic, physical, geopolitical, militaristic theocracy. Uh, yeah, these guys all reject that. Oh, well. Anyway, to continue, back to Isaiah chapter 62. Isaiah 62 foretells the remarriage of Yahweh with Israel, just like Hosea chapter 2 foretold the time of a remarriage. And let me make this observation. This is so critically important. We, we've touched on this at different times. When we read in the Old Testament, when we read a text that is focused on any given motif, any given motif, a uh, theme, excuse me, that does not mean that other themes are being excluded by that. You know, it absolutely blows me away, William, when men make the argument, well, uh, you know, Daniel 12 cannot be 1 Corinthians 15 because Daniel 12 contains the, the resurrection of the unjust. And, and you did a fantastic job the other day answering that false hermeneutic. The point being that in the Hebraic mindset, if you are talking about covenant, you're talking about the marriage. If you're talking about the marriage, you're talking about the land. If you're talking about the land, you're talking about the temple. If you're talking about the temple, you're talking about the priesthood, the sacrifices. You're talking circumcision. 
Because you see, the Jews, the ancient Hebrews, had what I will refer to as a holistic view of their world. They did not divorce any of these things from one another. They did not divorce marriage from covenant, pun intended there, by the way. They did not dichotomize between circumcision and the lamb. They did not dichotomize between circumcision and the Sabbath. Every single one of these elements, these themes and these motifs, are absolutely bound up together with one another. Now, I have cited N.T. Wright and uh, Kaler, David Kaler, to this effect. They recognize the interwovenness, to use that term, between all of these themes, so that even though, to give a good instance, as David Kaler points out, even though the word covenant only appears a couple of times in the book of Romans, the concept of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the promised Abraham, that is covenant from the from the get-go. It's the Abrahamic covenant. And then when he cites from the law of Moses, that's covenant. So, again, to reiterate, this is truly important. And the point of all this, when Hosea mentions the remarriage and making of a covenant, what did that mean? Well, it meant temple. It meant priesthood. It meant circumcision. It meant all of those things. Because the covenant had been broken. The marriage had been broken. But the marriage would be restored, not in the same way, by any stretch of the imagination. It would be a transformed, a revived, but a transformed body of Israel. They would be transformed from the old covenant form to the new covenant form. They would be transformed from the body of Moses to the body of Christ. And boy, is it ever just horrendously sad when people want to deny those realities. Okay, with those things said, folks, and to drive home those points once again, we go to Isaiah chapter 62 and verse 4. Here is Yahweh speaking to the ten northern tribes, and he says, and, and again, this is at, at the time of their divorcement, their dispersion, and the Lord says, you will no more be termed forsaken, neither shall your land any more be termed desolate, but you shall be called Hephzibah. Hephzibah. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, quite literally, it means married. And your land, Beulah. You know, William, I wonder how many times we have sang that song, um, O Beulah land and never, ever really given thought to what we were saying. Uh, many, way, many times. Wait a minute. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, when I, and by the way, Hephzibah means my delight is in you. Beulah is married. Uh, I apologize for that. I, I, I get those two confused very often. So uh, it dawned on me years and years ago that here is Yahweh promising that the time was going to come in the time of the remarriage to Israel. And he said, you will be called Beulah. I mean, we we sometimes say, what? Oh, well, when we get to heaven, that's Beulah land. Well, then that must mean we're not married now. Because Beulah and Beulah land is the remarriage of Yahweh to his people under the new covenant. Well, wait a minute. Uh, if, if Beulah is heaven and we do not enter Beulah until we enter heaven, then that's when the, not only when the wedding takes place, that's when the new covenant is made. 
Look, folks, you can't have a wedding without a covenant. If you've got a covenant, you've got a wedding. So if we've got to wait until we get to heaven, the ostensible, supposed Beulah land, then we're still waiting on the wedding. We're still waiting on the new covenant. William, does that make sense? That makes a ton of sense, and uh, that's a very, very uh, powerful uh, argument and illustration uh, to demonstrate, you know, just where we are with the new covenant, and um, it's undeniable. And, And it seems to me, William, it seems to me that we have a real conundrum here for uh, virtually all, all futures, okay? We want to take a note that in William and my uh, upbringing, in, in our background, in our tradition, we used to say, oh, beautiful land, oh, beautiful land, all the time, as an anticipation of going to heaven. Well, guess what? In the futurism of some who are amillennialists, this is a lot of reformed amillennialists, this is also... Uh, the view of many post-millennialists. This was the uh, position taken by Joel McDermott. And by the way, William, on Facebook, Kyle Mantingale took the position this morning of a restored earth, of a physically restored physical earth. So he is joining men like N.T. Wright it, and David Hester tried He he didn't want to come down on that position, but he kind of hinted toward that position. But this is this is certainly the position uh, of Sam Frost, for instance. Well, the new heaven and the new earth, so to speak, is this creation right here in Isaiah 62. It is the time in which Yahweh's people would no longer be called desolate. They would no longer be called forsaken. They would be called married. Now, the Lord says your land shall be married. Okay, that's the new creation. So once again, if we are waiting on the new creation to come, then Yahweh has not remarried Israel. And to reiterate the point, there is no new covenant. So wherever you put the new creation, and by the way, folks, let's not forget, the new creation is the time of the wedding, which is the time of the Messianic temple. Wherever you there, wherever, therefore, you put the new creation, wherever you put the wedding, It is there that the new covenant is made. So to reiterate, no wedding, no land, no new creation, no new heaven and new earth, then the church is not married. If the church is not married, there is no new covenant. And if there is no new covenant, where does that leave us? What does that mean? William, are you there? Hello, William. Well, I seem to have lost William. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, folks, look, the, the power of this is just absolutely incredible. These promises of the way are purely eschatological, okay? Isaiah chapter 62 is the remarriage of Yahweh with Israel. When would that wedding take place? Well, according to Revelation chapter 19, the wedding would take place at the coming of the Lord. In the judgment of Jerusalem, i.e. Old Covenant Babylon, which was the adulterous generation of the first century. Well, guess what, folks? Old Covenant Israel, the ten northern tribes, committed adultery. They were divorced. They were destroyed. And Yahweh departed from them. In the last days, 
the Lord said, he would remarry her, he would return to her, he would resurrect her. But this is so important. In Hosea chapter 6 and verse 11, after saying and talking about Israel's harvest, that the harvest of the ten northern tribes, which was being divorced, put to death, being departed from, the Lord said that Judah, at the time of the salvation of the remnant, Judah would have her harvest, the same kind of harvest as the ten northern tribes. Well, I believe William is back, so that's good. <laughs> But, yes. <laughs> but we, I was making a point that in, in the futurism of men like Sam Frost, Kyle Nightingale, uh, and all of those who are anticipating a new heaven and a new earth, if, if the new heaven and new earth is the time, if that's the new creation, and obviously it is, unless you want to have two land promises, okay, uh, so unless there are two eschatological land promises, unless there are two promises of the wedding, then the wedding takes place in the new creation. But that means the new covenant is for the new creation. And so when people talk about we are looking for a new heaven and a new earth, by making that statement, they are of necessity saying that Israel has not been remarried, but if Israel has not been remarried, <coughs> we don't have a new covenant. And so, not realizing that she had left there a moment ago, William, I was asking, what are the implications of saying that we do not have the new covenant? That the church, the body of Christ, is not married to Christ. Well, that would mean no salvation. It uh, should imply that we're still under the law because the um, new covenant was to be formed, you know, after the law was done away. And so if you don't have that yet, then, you know, we'd have to at least the law would have to still be enforced. Um, But, you know, one of the main things is, you know, there would be no salvation uh, as a result. And uh, that would just really destroy all of the um, new covenant blessings as you are, you know, pointing out, you know, no gathering of Israel and the Gentiles. I mean, none of that would be the case without the new covenant because all of those things take place as a result of it and uh, within it. Amen. Amen. Well, th- this whole concept, and again, folks, let's not forget, all this has to do with the Messianic temple because you see the making of the new covenant at the time of the wedding. Nothing is more inextricably bound up with temple than wedding and covenant. Uh, And as we saw last week in Hosea chapter 3, Israel would be for many days, be for a long time, without the priest, without the altar, without the ephod, and without sacrifice. Uh, and, And so in the last days, however, the Lord would return, and Israel would serve David, her king. Well, again, serving David for king is the time of the new covenant. According to Ezekiel chapter 37, at the time of the restoration of Israel, both houses, bringing both sticks together, guess what would happen? The Lord said, I will make a covenant of peace with both houses of Israel, and they shall serve David their king. So you have all of these motifs working together being conflated together by the scriptures to be fulfilled in the last days at the time of the Messianic temple. Once again, all of these things go together. And you cannot separate them from each other without doing grave violence to the to the entire thought of Hebraic views of their very existence uh, of their of their land and their temple and their priesthood and their relationship with God all of it all of it is interwoven together and simply cannot be uh, separated and divorced from one from one another so 
Here in Isaiah chapter 62, you shall no more be termed forsaken, neither shall your land any more be termed desperate, but you shall be called Hephzibah, and your land Beulah, for the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. Well, you know, William, this entire issue of the land, and let's not forget, land and temple go hand in hand. You can't separate them. You cannot divorce them. And, and by the way, there's a really, really excellent little book, uh, and the author is Gary Burge, B-U-R-G-E. Now, I corresponded with Mr. Burge a little bit, and at first he was somewhat enthusiastic about our correspondence. Uh, I actually asked him to appear on this radio program with you and me, William. Uh, when he asked me what it was about, I explained that we were prayers. He said, well, I think probably I'd rather not do that. And so uh, even though we just wanted to talk about his book, <clears throat> Jesus of the Land, he, he was unwilling to do so. But I want to tell you, Mr. Burge does a really, really good job of showing the relationship between Jesus' ministry, Jesus' message, the symbolism, especially in the book of John, that Jesus uses for himself, which proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that for Jesus, he is our dwelling place. He is our land that the land has now become identified with Jesus. Not with dirt anymore, but with Jesus himself. A classic example of this. Now, look, folks, again, do not forget, your land shall be married. Your land, that's temple imagery. Where's the temple? In Jerusalem. What's in Jerusalem? The temple. Your land shall be married. Well, notice this. In John chapter 15, Jesus said, I am the true vine. <clears throat> this is so rich. This is so wonderful. And, and it's a really, really good example of how if we are not in touch with the, the, the what the German scholars call the death and leaven, the life situation, of Jesus and his apostles, as they wrote and as they spoke, if we are not familiar with the, with the colloquialisms, the euphemisms, even the slang in some instances, if sometimes if we are not paying attention to where they're standing or sitting, as they're talking, we lose out on the meaning of the text. Here's what I mean by that. It is generally believed that in John chapter 15, Jesus was in the very close proximity of the temple. And he said, I am the true vine. You're the branches. Produce fruit unto me. Now, why is this so significant? What is there in the context the historical context. No, it's not mentioned right there in John, but any Jewish reader and any Jew hearing these words in the first century would think immediately of something that was right there, right then. Because you see, at the temple, just inside the opening of what we would call the foyer, was an incredible grapevine with the vines <clears throat> on either side of the opening going up to the very top of the opening and hanging from the lintel was a cluster of grapes, only these are not literal grapes. Josephus tells us that this cluster of grapes was as tall as a man, which means it would be about five foot five, five foot seven at that time. 
and was made of pure gold. I, I got to tell you, that is just incredible. Absolutely incredible. Now, the vine, you know, what was made of precious metal. But here, this cluster of grapes as tall as a man made of pure gold. And guess what that vine, <clears throat> guess what that cluster represented, folks? It represented Israel. That's right, Israel. Because you see, going all the way back to Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 2, the Lord says, I brought you out of Egypt as a right vine, a truly a right vine. But you have become unto me a perverted wine, vine. Here you have the Lord calling Israel the vine. In Isaiah chapter 5, written much earlier, obviously, than Jeremiah. In Jer Isaiah chapter 5, the Lord called Israel his vineyard, his vine, his vineyard. So, and, and by the way, the, many of the Psalms likewise use the imagery of Israel as the vine. So it's little wonder that when the temple at Jerusalem was built, that it, as a stunning symbol of Israel's very existence, they would have this golden vine because it represented the nation, it represented the land. I mean, after all, when the children of Israel were getting ready to go into the land and 12 spies were sent into the land to spy it out, to bring back a report, what was it that they brought back? <clears throat> Clusters of grapes as big as a man that had to be suspended on a pole between two men to carry it. I mean, that's just stunning. And so here in the book of Numbers, in recounting <clears throat> Israel's initial contact with the land, the great cluster symbolized its richness, it, its fruitfulness. And again, that theme, that imagery continued to be used throughout Israel's history. So here's Jesus in John chapter 15 saying, I am the true Vine. You know what that says? You know what that indicates? You know what that <clears throat> would likewise symbolize? I am the true temple. I mean, you can't separate the vine from the temple. So if Jesus says, I am the true vine, he is likewise saying, I am the true temple. So when Isaiah 62 speaks of the time of Yahweh restoring Israel. And Jesus identifies himself as the land when he identifies himself as the temple, when he identifies himself as the true vine. Folks, we, we've got to pay attention to these applications. We cannot ignore what Jesus had to say and his application of the imagery that identifies Israel, her land, and her temple. It's simply inappropriate to ignore these images. Wouldn't you like to jump in here and offer, you, offer some thoughts? Well, I think that is such a powerful um, illustration of Israel uh, as a people going into the land and the symbolism of, you know, the grapes uh, and the grapevine, et cetera. Uh, I, you know, it's very obvious, one, that um, Christ becomes 
everything that is embodied in all of the imagery that we find in the Old Testament, and particularly those major themes as you're uh, expounding upon, such as the land, uh, all of that, you know, um, just sort of comes together in the person, you know, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so he is the temple, he is the true vine, etc. Um, he is the light of the world. All of those things that um, were critical, you know, the true bread, etc. So, uh, but this imagery uh, concerning, you know, the true vine, that, you know, that just kind of, to me, takes it back to his being the seed. Uh, it's the source for all the life that uh, was in Israel. You know, he is the ultimate source of everything that we have for our uh, relationship with the Father, for our salvation, et cetera. It's all embodied in Christ. And, um, you know, just to hear you talk about the, uh, you know, that cluster of grapes that they had to put on poles to carry from the land um, demonstrated the uh, entrance into the land, if you please. I mean, I know that uh, they got delayed because of their unbelief, et cetera, but it does show uh, what was there. And uh, and so with Christ claiming to be that, that's also, to me, indicative of the fact that they were about to enter the new land uh, because of his being the true vine and what that symbolized. And there it is again in the imagery of the temple, et cetera, you know, with, with that cluster of gold that was the size of a man. So that's that's pretty awesome stuff. That's, that's uh, really, really good. And uh, just, you know, there, it's so amazing to see how many major themes and concepts that can be developed, you know, through uh, the study of the Word of God. And it seems like they come out with more light as we get deeper and deeper into the study of, uh, you know, covenant eschatology, et cetera. This is the framework for all of those things to blossom and to really be shown in the light in which they are uh, intended. Well, I, I agree, with obviously, 100 percent. And uh, to say that it's rich and, and to say that we discover more and more of this because we are studying eschatology, I think, is a huge understatement. Uh, and, and another thing that goes right along with it uh, is, is what is so fascinating to me, and I know it is you as well, William, we've commented on this, on this so many, many times. We have so many scholars today. I'm talking world-class, major scholars who, who are writing books like Gary Burge that I mentioned a few moments ago. Books that just open our eyes to see these, these connections, open our eyes to the reality of the confirmation of covenant eschatology. And when we read these books by these scholars, you're going, wait a minute, wait a minute. How in the world could you write those things and not be a full credulist? That's not possible logically, consistently, textually. If you see all of these connections that are so wonderful, that are so powerful, that are so clear, how do you not see the eschatological implications of that? I, I, I mean, it's just, <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's truly, truly amazing. As we continue to, uh, to read the, the, this literature, and, and then when we start bringing this stuff out in, in our Facebook debate with these people, they act like, we're, we're the biggest dummies in the world, and yet they've never read these books. They have never done the research. And they become downright insulting of us for having read the books. And you just got to shake your head and, and in wonderment that someone who has absolutely done no research no scholarly studies whatsoever can be so arrogant in their view, 
so arrogant uh, of the, the history, the culture, the context in which the Bible was written, the history, the culture, the context that these scholars are pointing out in such a marvelous way. And, and that, to me, is the part of the beauty of this, folks. Uh, as I tell people very, very frequently, when I will go over some concepts, and I just tell them, look, folks, Preterists didn't make this up. What I'm sharing with you here <coughs> is straight from the world of scholarship, men who are not Preterists. But guess what? What they say leads directly to Preterism. And, and that, to me, is part of the thrill, part of the joy uh, of constantly reading this scholarly literature and gleaning from them the, these nuggets, this information, this documentation that fully supports covenant eschatology. And, you know, our adversaries can scoff at us all they want to. Uh, it's just like the other day, William Bell cited how Josephus said that Daniel chapter 9 was being fulfilled in the first century. Sam Frost's only response to that was Josephus contradicted himself. <laughs> I mean, he didn't prove anything. He just said it. And yet here we have documentation. And, and let me give another illustration here. To me, this is so very, very powerful. By the way, uh, I'm, at, I'm almost through posting a series of articles entitled Sam Frost Upside Down. And the reason I wrote this series of articles was that Sam Frost wrote an article trying to prove that the book of Revelation is not really all that concerned about, about the uh, eschatological consummation. It's more concerned about people dying and going to heaven. And then ultimately, finally, at the end of time, then the earth is annihilated. Well, it's not really annihilated, although he uses that term. Uh, it's then recreated. You have a literal, physical, material, uh, new heaven and a new earth. But the point being, in, in previous writings, Sam Frost says, all the righteous, all of the faithful, from righteous Abel onward. When they died, they went right straight to heaven. Because after all, they're people of faith. Okay? Since they since Abraham, for instance, it was said of him that he was justified by faith. Well, if he was justified by faith, then he must have gone to heaven when he died. Well, that flies directly in the face of, of a host of scriptures that I'm sharing on uh, in this series of articles. And all of this is, you know, I, I'm giving all of this to urge you to go there to read those, uh, those articles and, and to see how the opponents of covenant eschatology are willing to so overtly Deny, number one, deny the explicit statements of the Bible. Number two, to overtly pervert the word, the explicit word of the Bible. And number three, to absolutely refuse to engage in honorable dialogue. I have asked Sam Frost, probably over 10 times, to define the most holy place. What is the most holy place? And I made the comment, it's heaven. It's what the most holy place of the, uh, of the Old Covenant temple, it's what the most holy place represented. It represented the presence of God. Now, by that, it likewise represented the New Covenant, because the New Covenant brings us into the presence of God. But it's all interrelated. You cannot separate it. Well, again, I have asked Sam Frost to define what is the most holy place. All that he has 
done is to deny that it is heaven. Well, <clears throat> let's see here. Jesus Christ entered into the holy places not made with hands. He entered into that which is within the veil. Hebrews chapter 6, 19 and 20. Well, what's within the veil? The most holy place. But he entered into heaven itself. Hebrews 9, 24. <coughs> now, since Jesus <coughs> entered into that which is within the veil, and he entered into heaven itself, then that which is within the veil, i.e. the most holy place, is heaven itself. Furthermore, the book of Revelation says, no man could enter into the temple, the naos, that's the most holy place, until the wrath of God contained in the seven bowls, seven vials, spoken of in Revelation 15 and 16. No man could enter into the naos, the most holy place, until the wrath of God was completed. The wrath of God is contained in the seven bowls. The seventh bowl would be poured out on Babylon. So no man could enter into the most holy place until the judgment of Babylon. So I've asked Sam Cross to identify Babylon. He refuses to do so. You know, if you've got a theology uh, that you think is biblical and true, why do you refuse to answer questions like that? That are so simple. I mean, uh, how complicated is the question? Define the most holy place. Define and identify Babylon or Revelation. Well, here's the problem, folks. Sam Frost and others know that if they answer some of these very simple things, just like the issues that we covered tonight about Israel and the land, Israel and the wedding, they know that if they answer these questions, biblically, their futurism goes up in smoke. It disappears. It falsifies. And so instead of answering these simple questions, instead of uh, engaging in honorable dialogue, they ridicule us, they condemn us, they call us heretics, and they call us ignorant and stupid and a whole lot of other uh, adjectives that, that we can point out, which, by the way, none of which makes us say the Lord. I mean, you can ridicule me all day, all day long. Uh, you can, you know, you, you can call me stupid, ignorant all you want, but that doesn't falsify the arguments that I, arguments that I make. You've got to provide exegesis. You've got to provide solid proof and evidence of my argument being false or that your argument is true and valid. Calling other people names doesn't prove anything. But it certainly seems that these, an awful lot of these people, and it's not just people on Facebook, but folks, this is people in the dispensational world, uh, and all they do is throw insults at credulous. And all they do is tell us and tell their audience, well, the preterists cannot find their doctrine in any of the early church writings. You can't find preterists in the creed. You can't find it in early church history. And this proves what? It proves what? It proves nothing whatsoever. And so, when we present on this program good, solid, exegetical evidence, when we provide through good, solid hermeneutics the case for covenant eschatology, all that we do is ask that you consider it. Consider what we've had to say tonight about the new covenant, about the wedding, about the land. 
How could there not be a new creation in Christ now? How could the wedding not be a reality if we are under the new covenant? If we are under the new covenant, we are in the land. If we are in the land, the Messianic temple is a reality. And with that, we are out of time. I want to thank you for joining us this evening on Two Guys in the Bible. Here on Fulfilled Radio, a voice you can trust. And with that, William, I will say, good night. God bless. All right. Thank you, Don. Another good study. And looking forward to being back with you on next week. Ladies and gentlemen, have a good evening. And God bless you all. Thank you for joining the Two Guys in a Bible radio broadcast. On behalf of Don Preston and myself, we'd like to say, have a very pleasant day. And may God bless. Until next time, we'll see you on Fulfilled Radio, a voice you can trust.